An advanced team of Kenyan police have arrived in the troubled Caribbean nation of Haiti as part of a UN-backed initiative largely financed by Washington. The Kenya government's decision to deploy the police has faced a fierce opposition at home. The contingent is part of a multinational security support mission which will work in collaboration with Haiti's police. The mission is tasked with pushing back the gangs and reclaiming key government infrastructure. There are currently an estimated 200 gangs in Haiti, which joined forces earlier in the year to overrun the country's capital, Port-au-Prince. So this week on the program, we look at some of Haiti's troubled political history, the reasons behind Kenya's involvement in the mission, and why it has faced such fierce pushback. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, joining me now to unpack Kenya's mission to Haiti are, from Los Angeles, Dr. Jemima Pierre, Haitian-born professor of race and political economy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Professor Rosa Friedman, international conflict expert and professor of law, conflict and global development at the University of Reading in the UK, and in Nairobi, Faith Odiambo, president of the Law Society of Kenya. Welcome to the program. Let me start off with you, Dr. Pierre. A Kenyan-led U.S.-backed multinational security support mission has arrived in Haiti as part of a force to combat the influence of powerful criminal gangs there. First, do give us the context of the current instability in Haiti. That's a long question to answer. Um, one of the key things to, to think about is that this will be um, the third major um, foreign intervention in Haiti on uh, pushed by the U.S. Um, let us all remember that the U.S. was behind, the U.S. friends in Canada was behind a coup d'etat in Haiti in 2004, where Haiti's elected, uh, democratically elected president was removed from office by U.S. Marines, put on a plane and sent to the Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. And then the U.S. then, um, because of its seat, the U.S. and France, because of their seats on the permanent, uh, U.N. Permanent uh, Security Council, were able to actually um, send in a so-called uh, peacekeeping mission to Haiti. So basically, Haiti's constitution, democratically elected, uh, was, was run roughshod over by the U.S., France, and Canada. They removed our president and then installed uh, an illegal council uh, of, 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 of people to basically run Haiti um, on, on, until then. And then we had a, basically uh, from 2004 to 2017, mm -hmm. Um, any at any time between fourteen to, to uh, fourteen thousand to seventeen thousand um, military officials from all over the world run by the U.S. and what they call the core group, which was a group of non-Haitian um, right. foreigners who basically controlled um, what was going on in Haiti. Um, in two thousand and ten, right after the earthquake, the U.S. paid actually for elections in Haiti, where they changed the election results and installed uh, 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 this uh, new devalierist uh, uh, person, uh, Michel Martelly, which then um, has uh, this political party, PHTK, has right. been running Haiti since 2010. So I think if we don't understand the fact that Haiti is actually under occupation from 2004 forward, um, 2004 forward, we don't understand that what the U.S. is doing is absolutely illegal and unconscionable and how the how the Haitians have have suffered through through that. And so what you had is uh, uh, another president that came after Michel Martelly in two, 2021 was assassinated because of infighting within that political party. The U.S. then handpicked and replaced a prime minister that no one voted for um, in 2021. There were protests against this prime minister, protests against, and as Kenyans would know this, protests against the IMF push to remove fuel subsidies on Haitians would actually increase uh, inflation by 40% overnight. Right. So these were protests ongoing, democracy protests, and that the installed prime minister, Alio Oli, would say were, gang, were gangs as opposed to uh, people really protesting. So let me bring in uh, Professor Friedman here because um, uh, Dr. Pierre has talked about the influence and uh, impact of um, the U.S. in Haiti. You know, countries including the U.S., uh, Professor Friedman and Canada, are the ones calling for an international police mission we've heard there but they've been hesitant to commit their own troops to a role in such an effort so why isn't the u.s part of the troop producing countries here 
Well, let's be clear, the United States at one point actually occupied Haiti uh, from 1915 till just before the Second World War and would be reluctant to put its troops back on the ground given that it, that it was part of the, the attempt to recolonize Haiti. The, and we must remember, Haiti is the first country to throw off the yoke of slavery, to abolish slavery, to get rid of colonial masters. Um, but also we have to bear in mind that Western nations, Global North nations, stopped giving peacekeepers in the 1990s when their peacekeepers were involved with all sorts of horrific scandals, sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, Canadians allegedly roasting a Somali child over a spit, and then also were being killed um, in mm -hmm. countries like Somalia. So they stopped donating peacekeepers many years ago and instead donate money. But the biggest question is, why do we have an international intervention in Haiti at all? And my colleague, Dr. Pierre, touched upon this. Haiti has a long history of international intervention after international intervention by mm -hmm. people, peacekeepers, police forces from around the world who do not know the language, do not know the culture or the context, and actually perpetuate the cycles of violence by, by coming in and imposing top-down solutions rather than supporting Haiti to create Haitian solutions for Haitian problems. And we have to ask why that is. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the, this country in the Caribbean is the only country where international interventions are imposed? We look at Mexico or El Salvador, Honduras, they're all supported to create their own solutions for their own problems with the support of the international community. And really the only answer can be because Haiti is the first black sovereign republic in the world and that this is just racism. So, uh, Professor Friedman, is an international force, in your view, necessary in Haiti? Absolutely not in the form that it's been created. So there is no point having an international force who do not speak the language, are not from the local region, do not understand the context. Now, Haitian, the Haitian army is relatively new. Haitian only, Haiti only got a military again in 2017. The police force only numbers 12,000 individuals. There's clearly a need for support for the military and for the army, support for training, support in terms of weapons, and I don't mean the weapons going into the hands of the gangs. But that support should be coming from CARICOM countries, and it should be support that's requested by Haiti right. and provided in a way that is suitable for the Haitians. And when I say requested by Haiti, I don't mean the illegitimate elite governments that Dr. Pierre was talking about. I'm talking about the Haitians themselves, and there are such a robust and vibrant civil society in the country that are simply not being listened to by the international community. So, Faith, you know, Kenya has sent the troops there on that international mission to Haiti. You know, it has sent uh, troops before inside Africa, but never outside um, Africa here. Did this come as a surprise to you, especially being a police force rather than a military force? Yes, it was quite a surprise because even the uh, deployments we have seen around the region before are always the Kenya Defense Forces. And the challenge that now we, uh, most were raising that is, uh, is it possible to deploy the National Police Service? Because as per our Constitution, um, Article uh, 140, uh, sub Article 8, it talks about the national forces, the national forces as defined under the Constitution, the court interpreted to mean the Kenya Defense Forces. So Kenyans were quite surprised that the National Police Service were going to be deployed outside the country and that's why there was quite an uproar. Because even if you look within, mm -hmm. we feel that the National Police Service have not been able even to deal with certain militia that have been a challenge, especially at the northern parts of the country and the cattle rustling that has caused a lot of deaths that most times um, the government is forced to even bring in the Kenya Defense Forces. And so the outcry was that these, the National Police Service has not been trained for such extreme uh, measures. They are not ready for a deployment at that level. Mm -hmm. And also the Constitution does not support or does not foresee deployment of the National Police Service. So why is Kenya getting involved then in Haiti? Well, the president has come out to say there are certain reasons why he feels um, after uh, the multinational um, security support called by the UN Council in uh, by the UN Security Council in October 2023 mm -hmm. that Kenya will be uh, fulfilling its humanitarian obligations uh, to come and try and support other countries that are going through difficult periods. Secondly, there's been the talk about 
um, Kenya being strategic as this is more of geopolitics that Kenya to raise its profile in the international community mm -hmm. as uh, raising solutions and more so what the people of Kenya feel is that this is more of an opportunity to make money and we doubt that even the national police uh, service forces that have been deployed would actually get those payments because we are aware that the US government funded about one, 108 million US dollars um, to support the deployment of the national police service. So um, the, the critics um, or the criticism is that this is more of financially motivated action and also a need to be seen in the international scene right. that Kenya is out there doing something different, trying to support the international community. And we, instead of securing our internal borders, we are looking outside. And most critics feel that this is more of a financially motivated move. Dr. Pierre, to you there, and, and on a very brief note, global geopolitics here, money opportunity, what do you see? Who exactly asked Kenya specifically and the other countries to intervene in Haiti? Well, as we all know, this is a U.S. orchestrated um, move. And that, that's why we have to say this is a U.S. move to use Kenyan, um, what we call mercenaries in Haiti, to be honest. Um, to, to, to use foreign soldiers to come in and do the dirty work that it doesn't want to do. We have to be clear that the U.S. first asked Canada to lead a mission to Haiti in 2022. Canada said no. It then asked Brazil. Brazil said no. It asked Mexico. Mexico said no. Um, and then it asked some of the CARICOM countries, and they said no. And so all of a sudden, there's these, you know, we, we know that there's a plan with Kenya. And nobody, no one knows um, exactly um why Kenya was chosen, except to, to that Kenya was more willing than any other country to be the face of U.S. Um, um, intervention in Haiti. I have to say two two quick things about this. Mm -hmm. hey, the, the U.N. intervention in Haiti, the, the occupation that happened from 2004, um, led to thousands, 30,000 killed from cholera, where the U.N. soldiers were dumping feces in our local water and killed 30,000 people and sickened a million, led to tons of sexual exploitation, um, and until this day, there are uh, hundreds of women suing U.N. soldiers for leaving children behind, right. um, gang raping of girls and so on. But I also wanted to say that this mission is not a U.N. mission. And I want people to actually understand this because they're saying U.N. sanctioned mission, mission because the U.N. specifically said they did not want to lead a peacekeeping mission to Haiti because it would require too much robust use of force. Now, to ask yourself what that means when the U.N. doesn't want to do it, which is why the U.S. is paying Kenyan soldiers mm -hmm. and, and to do this. And so why is it that, that the U.S. is so desperate to have this force in Haiti, if not for something greater than just having um, just so-called gang violence? Mind you, Ecuador, right. um, the U.N. leader in Haiti, um, has, more, has a higher um, um, homicide rate than Haiti does. Mexico has gang cartels. Um, Jamaica has been under state of emergency for the past three years because of gangs. So you have to understand that this is not about so-called gangs because if the U.S. really wanted to take care of gangs, right. they would actually sanction and imprison the oligarchy, the non-Haitian oligarchy that is actually feeding and fueling ammunition and guns into the neighborhoods. Professor Friedman, um, Dr. Pierre has raised a very interesting question here. Why is the U.S. seemingly desperate to have an international force in Haiti and this not being a mission deployed under the UN peace mission, how is it different from other peace missions? I mean, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Pierre actually, because um, what she's saying about the geopolitics in China is incredibly interesting and incredibly useful for understanding what's going on here. Um, but, and I'm gonna pick up on the, actually the point that she, she was making just now around this impunity that is being provided for, for the Kenyan, um, for the Kenyan peacekeepers or police forces that are coming in, because I think this is really crucial to understand before thinking about these geopolitical questions. The agreement between Haiti and Kenya, or between Haiti and the UN for this transitional task force, will mean that no Kenyan police officer can be prosecuted in Haiti for any crime or human rights abuse that they perpetrate while there. This level of impunity is outrageous. Mm -hmm. We know, as Dr. Pierre was saying, that the UN brought cholera into Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake. We know about the mass sexual exploitation and abuse. We know about the corruption. We also know about the corruption generally in Haiti of elites and, and the gangs at times and international actors taking all the resources from mm -hmm. this resource-rich country. 
But this idea of absolute impunity for police officers goes against the rule of law and every part of international human rights law. We should be shouting from the rooftops about this. This is something that should never be allowed to happen. And not only is it being allowed to happen, it's being spearheaded by the UN and by the United States who go around the world telling countries that they must obey international human rights law and meanwhile are giving complete impunity to the Kenyan police officers to not do so. So, Faith, you know, we've seen quite some resistance in Kenya to this mission, but we've also heard uh, from Dr. Pierre that the, the troops will be going to unfamiliar territory. So what do you see as some of the main challenges that could be anticipated in this mission? So uh, let me first start by saying that um, this was challenged in our jurisdiction. And um, the law in the National Police Service Act 107, 108, and 109 allows deployment outside Kenya, but as long as there's reciprocal arrangements, and the first time Kenya having any um, agreements or arrangements with Haiti was in 2023, and that's exactly after the court gave those directions stopping the deployment at that instance, and secondly, there had been no parliamentary approval. Mm -hmm. They went ahead and looked for some sort of agreement but one week later, after getting that, we see um, the things go in disarray. There's no more parliament. There's no more leadership. And they have already quickly run to parliament to get approval for the deployment to proceed. And in the Ukuru court case, LSK was also a party to those proceedings. Mm -hmm. We went back to court and, and sought the stoppage for the deployment. Um, because they, it was not Haiti was not a nation that could be said was possible of entering into any agreement with those, no possible government in power and no and no arrangements and even we could not ascertain even who they are coming to assist when there is already disarray in the country and the court issued orders barring that deployment. However, in disobedience of court orders, the head of state proceeded with the deployment and uh, the challenge that we see is that we have um, the National Police Service that is not properly trained for such extreme um, situations. We've seen the kind of gangs that are going on in Haiti and we have also seen um, the difficult terrain that there shall be. So we feel that this could be a possible bloodbath and we may be ferrying back bodies instead of um, having our police uh, force coming back home safely. All right, and we will be looking at those uh, further deployments uh, when we return uh, from the break. For now, we are going to take a short break. When we come back, we will look at some long-term solutions to the instability in Haiti. To stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Still with me are Dr. Jemima Pierre, Professor Rosa Friedman, and Faith Odiambo. Before the break, we looked at why Kenya has deployed police to Haiti. Let's now look at some long-term solutions to the crisis in Haiti. Dr. Pierre, and very briefly here, you know, Haiti has had a UN peacekeeping mission in the past. You've alluded to that, comprising of up to 9,000 troops, and that ended in 2017. So why did previous UN peacekeeping missions fail? Are there lessons that could be learned from past interventions here? Obviously, there, there hasn't been any lesson learned from past interventions. And the lesson that can be learned is to actually leave Haiti alone. I think what the, 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 the problem that's happening in Haiti is a problem of constant U.S. intervention, whether or not there is so-called gang violence. Mind you, three years ago, there was no talk of gangs in Haiti. So we have to wonder how it is that this is happening right now um, when there are thousands and millions of people in the street protesting the illegal um, uh, interventions of, of the U.S. In, in Haiti's political process. And so the long-term solution is to actually tell 
tell the core group, which runs pol politics in Haiti, to get out of Haiti, to dissolve Haiti, uh, to dissolve the core group, mm -hmm. to get the U.S. and its forces that are that are there to be out, and to leave Haiti alone. And the so-called Haitian solutions being led by the U.S. is not a Haitian solution. And until we can be left alone to actually take care of our, our, our situation, mm -hmm. um, the things it's 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 uh, it's like the definition of insanity: doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And stop the U.S. from sending guns and ammunition into Haiti because it's they're all coming from the U.S. And so if the U.S. would actually stop putting an embargo um, against uh, um, against all these uh, right. guns that are coming to the country, if they would sanction the the rich people, the oligarchs that are funding these young these young men, um, that would be the the first step of the problem. Instead of con constantly putting on, you know, now they put on they the U.S. handpicked a prime minister and a presidential council, which is not going to solve Haiti's problem because there's no demo demo democratic process for Haitians to be involved in their own um, um, self rule. Professor Friedman, the, the UN is currently reporting that uh, in 2023 there were 2,490 kidnappings, around 4,700 homicides. Can this Kenyan led mission make a difference here? Let's be clear Haiti is not the only country by far in the world that has gang violence and has problems with kidnapping and with. Uh, with what really comes from the power disparity between the ruling elites, the very corrupt elites having so much money and the people on the ground having so little, so little resources, so little money. Um, you know, and now we can see that there's also food scarcity and, and a looming famine in Haiti, a country that actually is so resource rich that there should never be a famine there. Mm -hmm. um, what we know is that where you have this huge power disparity and where you have huge corruption, there, there will be civil unrest and that often will lead into gang violence. We must remember that these gangs were actually first created by Aristide, who was fighting against the United States from interfering in Haiti. They weren't gangs in the way that we see today. They were people who were supporting Aristide and his right as the first democratically elected leader of Haiti to rule over Haiti without U.S. interference. Over the years, these, the, these groups of young men have morphed and changed, and they are mainly men. Of course, there are some women involved too. Um, but but with, with the more and more corruption in the country, with less and less likelihood of Haitians being allowed to choose their own leaders, because every time there is a democratic election, the, 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 the elected person gets taken away and a puppet government put into place, those, those groups of individuals who, who are supporting democracy have become more and more jaded. And that's where we've seen the type of gang violence that we have today. But we must remember that, that this is because of decades, if not centuries, of interference in Haiti's own electoral systems and, and the removal of anyone who is democratically elected, which then prevents people from seeing any hope of engaging properly in a political system. So, Faith, you've alluded to this before, the uh, legal hurdles that uh, Kenya is going through. And, you know, the court had previously extended that order blocking the mission's deployment, but the mission was approved by the Kenyan parliament. Now, in the United States, the Republicans there have been demanding for more transparency and clearer objectives. Does the deployment, Faith, conform to international laws here? Well, it doesn't because as much as Parliament gave the approval, they still enforce a valid court order raising constitutional concerns that have not been met. And the, and the executive has chosen to fail to meet the same. And we will have challenges with also ensuring that the Kenyan um, National Police Force also abide by the international humanitarian laws and human rights laws because Kenya has signed most of them and by dint of our constitution part of any um, international agreements and treaties that we have signed we are naturally bound by them um, as long as kenya had signed and ratified them so we don't have to domesticate those laws they form part and parcel of our laws when interpreting um, the laws of kenya and so there's already a legal challenge uh, that is still there, that is still pending. Also, Kenyans have been demanding accountability and transparency because we are sending um, our members of, of this uh, Kenya who are going out and there's no clear direction in terms of what terms are, are they going, how will we assure their security, what measures are being taken by the government to ensure that they will come back safe home and so apart from the funding even that has been given by the u.s government how sure are we that that will be sustained and for how long and what other support take into into consideration that there are different gangs with different interests and different motivations 
how will they be navigating those murky waters to ensure as well that they uphold the rule of law? So I'm going to get your final closing moments. And let me start off with you, Professor Friedman. Um, as you wind up, this mission is definitely a crucial test for the international community and for the Haitian crisis as well. How do you see the Haiti situation being resolved? There is only one way for the Haiti situation, as people call it, to be resolved. And that is to support Haitians to rule over themselves, to come up with Haitian solutions for Haitian problems, to understand that Haiti will only be free and will only flourish when um, Haitians are empowered to vote in free and fair elections and are supported to, to become the, the strong and rich country. And I don't just mean financially rich. Haiti is one of the richest countries in terms of culture and literature and art and civil society. But we always talk about Haiti in relation to violence and international interventions. We should be talking about Haiti in terms of the actual country that it is and the people within it. Um, this will only ever happen when Haiti is treated like all other countries in the region and supported to rule over itself and find its own solutions for its own problems, just as we would expect from every sovereign nation in the family of nations at the United Nations. Faith, your thoughts? Well, I, I associate myself with the thoughts of Redman and I add that I think they should be supported to develop their own um, programs and deal with the basic needs that the Haitians are suffering from, um, dealing with the challenge of poverty and setting up systems to ensure maybe better education, healthcare systems, and to help them develop back into a stable nation by supporting them instead of giving them solutions to um, driving solutions down their throats. I think if we treated them like other sovereign nations, and gave them the support to be able to rise to their feet the same way the kind of support that has been offered um, even by our government to the Somali government to try and help it set up, um, help uh, secure the government that is there, them coming up with their own solutions, coming up with their own systems, but you just being there to support, to ensure stability, that is the kind of support that I think would be better placed to ensure the Haitians develop their own solutions and come out of this as a stronger nation. Dr. Pierre, you have the final word. Well, I think Haiti needs to be left alone by the U.S., France, and Canada. I think Haitian people have their own solutions. We've done, we've had that for a long time. To be able to reach out to other um, partners in the region that's outside of the U.S. control and U.S purview. Um, we have partners. We have Cuba, who's always been in Haiti and in terms of sending doctors and professionals and so on. The assumption that Haitians cannot control themselves without the hand of the U.S. bringing in foreigners is itself a deeply racist um, assertion that's based on the fact that Haiti is actually the first free nation in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's the second republic in the in the Western Hemisphere after the U.S., but it's the word, first one that's free with 220 years of freedom um, um, behind it. And so it's because it is the free, first free black nation that it is actually constantly having a counter revolution waged against it by the West. And until we actually understand that and until we actually stop treating Haiti as if it's this a crazy nation of black people who don't know how to control themselves, we will not move forward. And until we remove all the foreign forces off of our territory, remove the U.S., remove France, which has no business in the region, um, remove Canada from our business, um, this will always be a destabilizing situation until Haiti brings itself out of this problem, again, the same way it did during the Haitian Revolution when it won its independence. So I trust that my people, the Haitian people, will come up with its own solution over time. But in the meantime, I think everyone else should step back and leave us alone. Indeed. And that's all we have time for this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our guests, Dr. Jemima Pierre, Haitian-born Professor of Race and Political Economy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Professor Rosa Friedman, International Conflict Expert and Professor of Law, Conflict and Global Development at the University of Reading in the UK and Faith Odiambo, President of the Law Society of Kenya. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on Facebook and X. You can also catch the show on our YouTube playlist. Do keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more at Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi, until next time, it's goodbye.